Hi, everyone. My name is Tierra Ortiz. And before I get started, I just wanted a quick show of hands of how many people have ever played an online video game. All right, we've got about half the audience. Can you keep your hands up and lower them if you play it? Or raise your hand if you've played a low latency video game. Think of a game like League of Legends, Dota, maybe World of Warcraft that requires pretty instantaneous response from keyboard to mouse. Well, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in a rural town outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And in high school, I was introduced to this game called League of Legends. And what's quite interesting is Netflix now has a show based off of the characters from the show. And what the purpose of the game is basically you're loaded into an arena with four other random people, and you're attempting to battle it out with another enemy team. And this game requires really, really intense moments where you're spamming your keyboard and clicking the mouse. and Literally every second matters, and it can be overall a really intense experience. At the time, again, I was in high school. I had zero familiarity with any networking concepts. But I did know that the ping that was reported at the top right of my screen did have some relationship with how quickly my clicks would be registered. So to be fairly honest, for several years, I would chalk up my losses as a result of poor, latency, of poor internet connection, and I would often reflexively blame things on my ping which was fair at the time because I did exceed over half a second at times and it was pretty bad. But it wasn't until I moved out of my small hometown and purchased my first real gaming computer and had fiber internet that I realized that it wasn't just my internet. I actually had a lot to improve upon. I was actually not very good at this game. And if I had only had better internet and a better understanding of the variability of my internet at the time, I would have known much sooner that I had a lot more to improve upon. And with that, I wanna talk about at Netflix, how we measure the real life latency of the internet. Again, my name is Tierra Ortiz. I'm a senior CDN reliability engineer. So every day, Netflix serves over 100 million view hours of content on our platform. This means for every hour, every minute, and every second of the day, there's many people from around the world tuning into Netflix. And for each of those people, there's this moment of truth. It's an opportunity for us to deliver a spectacular service with amazing quality of experience. Any failure of excellence as a result of rebuffers, high play delay, poor video quality, ultimately is a failure of the site reliability engineering team here at Netflix. So how do we ensure that our members have great experience? Well, we do this at Netflix by managing our own content delivery network, and that's Open Connect. So Netflix delivers our content with Open Connect, and the purpose of Open Connect is to provide our members with the best viewing experience possible. We do this by partnering with internet service providers from around the world to move our content closer to our members. This graph is showing a global view of where we've distributed our Open Connect appliances globally. These are our servers. I'll refer to them as OCAs. The dots in red represent where our servers are located at internet exchanges, and all of the dots in white all around the world represent where we've gifted our servers to internet service providers and they've been embedded in their data centers. Now, I wanna show some numbers to kind of exemplify the enormity of what we're working with. So at Netflix, we have over 230 million members and we are operating in over 175 different countries and we have over 18,000 servers deployed all around the world and to top it all off, our CDN reliability team is a grand total of 14 people. So you might be asking, like, how do we do this all? How can we, do, how can we even manage it, given the limited size of our team? Well, ultimately, this means that we need to be systemic in how we monitor and analyze our data. Effectively, we need to do more things with less people, and we need to extract insights from our data so that we can debug and root cause things qu quicker. One of the key responsibilities of the CDN reliability team is to ensure that our members have great quality of experience. Now, how do we define quality of experience here at Netflix? Well, we do it using a few metrics. So the first is we look at the bit rates that we're serving our members. So typically, higher bit rates mean better video quality for the end user. So what we'll look at is, we'll look at what is the time-weighted video bit rate for a member or a particular session compared to the maximum possible bit rate for them. We'll also look at rebuffers. So for a given session, how many rebuffers did they experience? And on aggregate, for every view hour, how many rebuffers can we expect? We'll also look at a metric called play delay. 
How quickly did it take for a member to hit that play button and to start receiving the first pieces of content? And lastly, what I'll be focusing a bit more on today is latency. So one of the questions we'll ask is, what is the round trip time between our clients and our, member, and our servers? Now diving in a bit more on that latency piece, what we typically use is a metric called round trip time, also abbreviated as RTT. And this is the duration of time that it takes for a client to make a request and receive a response. So here on the left, I have a Netflix user who's on a laptop, and they'll make a request to one of our OCAs and receive a response. And this total amount of time is known as RTT. As we begin examining round trip times for single sessions, we might consider looking at a few things. We might consider looking at the minimum round trip time, because this represents the best possible outcome for our session. We may also consider looking at the maximum round trip time because this represents the worst possible outcome. However, one of the problems with just looking at these two values is that the max round trip time can be heavily skewed by an outlier. And lastly, you might consider looking at averages. Again, average can be misleading too because if there's a huge outlier, it can pull the average quite a bit. Instead of looking at these three data points, what we typically look at at Netflix is a distribution of round trip time samples for a signal session. So this graph shows for that same session that has a minimum of 10 milliseconds, a maximum of almost four seconds, and an average of 360 milliseconds, this is the overall distribution of the sampled round trip times for it. And I wanna call out a few things. So the P50, we're sitting at around 115 milliseconds. What's interesting about the P50 is it basically says that like for half of the samples that we took, it's below 115 milliseconds. It tells a very different picture from what we get from the average on its own. The other thing that I wanted to call out is the P99. We're looking at a P99 of roughly two seconds. When compared to the maximum, you can see that this is a difference of 1.8 seconds. So just using the maximum wouldn't have been able to give us a clear picture of what was actually going on in the session. Now, you can imagine if we were to save this information in a histogram, it would be highly resource intensive, and given the scale that Netflix operates at, it would be so much data that we would need to store. So we need to answer the question of, how do we store this information without sacrificing too much accuracy? Well, back in 2013, Ted Dunning proposed an open source data structure called T-Digest. And T-Digest is a data structure for collecting, aggregating data, and extracting online ranked-based statistics without sacrificing accuracy or utilizing too much memory. And I'll explain a bit further about how this works. But if you're interested in reading more, the GitHub is linked right there below. Now, how T-Digest works is it'll look at a distribution, and this is a mixture of normals. I've taken this from Cam Davidson Pylon's article, Percentile and Quantile Estimation of Big Data. I thought this was a really great representation of how this works. So if we were to look at a distribution and summarize it as an empirical cumulative distribution function, what the T-Digest will do is it'll analyze this data set and it'll identify the points of interest. So it'll basically define the bins and how many accounts fall into that bin. The neat thing about T-Digest is that it configures the bins automatically and it ensures higher levels of accuracy towards the P0 and the P100. So that's how you maintain accuracy towards the edges and you're a little bit looser in the middle. So from this T-Digest data, what we end up getting is a T-Digest data structure. And here I've kind of demonstrated what one of those T-Digest data structure looks like at Netflix. So we'll have like our bin and the number of counts. And from this T-Digest, what we, we can begin asking questions like, hey, for this section, um, what is the P50? How about the, P, the P5, the P50, the P75? And the neat thing about T-Digest is that you can begin aggregating sessions together. So you can say, given the T-Digest of this one session and the T-Digest of another session, what's the P50 of the combined two? And T-Digest is able to do that, which is pretty neat. Now I wanna show how we use this to collect data here at Netflix. So for a sampled portion of the sessions, we start capturing the estimated round trip times. And again, going back to it, if we had to store this information in something like an array, you would imagine that this sort of level, this level of information would become too big for us to handle. However, instead of doing that, we summarize this data in a T-Digest and then publish it back. And just a quick fun fact, before we enabled T-Digest RTT collection, there was no way any one of us at Netflix could tell you what the P50 round trip time was for any of our sessions. All we had was the minimum and the maximum. Again, because 
storing all of this information is too computationally expensive. Now, I want to talk about how we can extract insights from the C-Digest data structure. Well, we recently had a Chris Rock Live event on March 4th, which was the first time we attempted to do a large broadcast at scale. As part of this, we need to be more aware of where we are incurring latency. So with this round trip time data, we can begin examining what's the P50 round trip time for different countries. And here's that visualization. So from this data, we can start segmenting it out and asking questions like, for people who live in New York City on this particular network and this device, what kind of expected P50 RTT are we seeing? And what kind of variability do they typically have in their sessions? Furthermore, this information can provide insights on where we might want to place additional capacity for latency-sensitive workloads. If we know that a particular portion of the country is, or the portion of the world is having higher latency due to being geographically distant from one of our servers, this can provide us with better ideas of where we should be placing these servers. In addition to doing this for capacity planning, we are also looking at this data long term to do anomaly detection. So given that we can analyze the P50 round trip time for countries, we can start looking at the historical data and identifying when we've become outside of the range of normal. And one of the neat things about using this information is that sometimes it gives us insights before any of our other QoE metrics have been hit. We've seen that RTT can be increased as a result of networking changes that might cause a client to travel around the world. So to kind of summarize my presentation, uh, T-Digest allows for us to extract insights with low overhead, and it allows for us to gain better data and improve our strategy for capacity planning. Furthermore, our SRE team needs to be data-driven and lean to operate our CDN at scale, and we need ongoing round-trip time monitoring because Overall, the conditions of the internet are constantly changing all the time. And for each one of those members around the world, we need to make sure that we're passing our moments of truth. And overall, we need to understand the impact of internet congestion under the best and worst circumstances. So I wanted to share a quick story. Um, I was recently in Los Angeles for a work event, and I had been away from home for about a month, so I was super excited to get home. So before going to bed, I went onto Google Maps and checked how long it would take for me to get to the airport. And much like the internet, you can imagine at midnight when I was checking, it's a lot less traffic on the road, and so this is not really representative of what I actually experienced. When I woke up the next day, it was actually an hour, and I was sprinting through the airport looking like a tomato. And to summarize, that's why you should always be monitoring the impact of traffic congestion on the internet and on the road. Thank you.